prefer today to do uh, Kabbalistics type study. And uh, maybe we'll talk a little bit about fulfillment and maybe a little bit about what Judaism is. Uh, but I'd like to go mostly via the Kabbalah today. That's kind of the emphasis of my studies over the years. It's my greatest interest. I like to know the things beyond the physical. I like to understand the reasons for things and how things are the way they are. And that's what's always excited me. And, and Kabbalah is uh, the best I've ever seen. I've never seen anything like it. It's just endless, endless material. And as much as you study, you know nothing, and there's so much more always waiting. And, and so I kind of like that stuff. And I also feel that, um, that it's, I feel like it's true. I really feel like the Kabbalistic stuff's true, even as mystical as it may sound, and you're talking reincarnation, and you're talking, you know, all kinds of uh, uh, interesting things that just don't seem uh, so, they seem super rational. Anyway, I, I also really feel that the Kabbalah's true. And the reason I feel it's true is because, is because the same rabbis that we trust with all of Jewish life are the same ones who are in the Zohar. So the book that we have that's the most authoritative Kabbalistic work is the Zohar. The, when you open the Zohar, it's all the words of our sages. And our sages are the same ones who give us Jewish daily living. I mean, the only w I put on tefillin every day, not because of Kabbalah. I put it on because the Torah commands me to. But the, wh how I know it's black boxes is the rabbis. I also keep Shabbat every week, not because of the Kabbalah. I keep Shabbat every week because the Torah says keep Shabbat. And it says refrain from 39 acts of malacha. But who defines the word malacha? Our sages, the rabbis. Well, those same rabbis are the one-stop shop for all the Kabbalistic, like, wild, mystical stuff. So if I'm going to trust them for how to keep Shabbat, and I'm going to trust them how to wear tefillin, or I'm going to trust them who's a Jew so I can marry my wife to make sure I married a Jew, and make sure I'm a Jew. So if I'm going to trust those same rabbis for my very Judaism and my daily Jewish life, so why would I draw the line at the mystical stuff that they are also teaching? It's the same exact rabbis. One-stop shop. I know today you get rabbis are more specialized. You get rabbis who are all into like dotting your I's, crossing your T's. You know, they're halachic rabbis. And then you got like, you know, the white-robed rabbis who are like, you know, the Kabbalistic, you know, type rabbis. But that wasn't how life was. In those days, it was, it was the same guy, the same exact person. So I really believe it's real. I really believe it's real. And also, when you go to the sheer amount of Kabbalistic works, it's, it's just so much, so much detail. I mean, you could fill this room from the floor to the ceiling, you know, out the door with Kabbalistic works, all of which are really unnecessary. You don't need them to be a good Jew. Most people are good Jews. They don't know any of that stuff. So why do we have so much detail on the secrets of creation if it's not real, if it wasn't part of the Sinai tradition of, you know, that we receive, because that's where it comes from ultimately, besides the stuff we have from Abraham and stuff. But all that detail came from Sinai as well. So why would we have all that? You don't need it. It's superfluous to being a good Jew. You can do all the commandments without it. And so that we have this vast body of information that's like rocket science detail, much of which I don't even understand. I'll tell you the truth, I don't understand 98% of the Kabbalistic, like the real true core Kabbalistic sources, I could translate the words, but I don't know what I'm saying. I don't know what it really is. The stuff I've studied and the stuff I share with you is, is I don't even know if it would reach 2% of the body of information in the Kabbalah. And it still fascinates me and, and has had me inspired and driven for the last 23 years. And I've barely scratched the surface of what's inside the Kabbalah. So I really believe it's the real deal, for those reasons. And, uh, and so let's begin. So we're trying to understand, today we're going to try to understand how it is that God created the world. How God, which is obviously undifferentiated oneness, because if it precedes creation, so it's, therefore it's before space and time. And anything that's before space and time is has absolutely no form. It, it doesn't, it's not a thing, right? 
if it's before space and time, it's not taking place in time, and it's not taking any place, which means it has no form, which means it's absolutely undifferentiated oneness. Because before there was something, there was absolutely nothing. And that nothing has to be formless. It's absolute nothingness. But nothingness is one nothingness. You can't have two nothings. Right? You can't divide it. It's indivisible. Right? If you divide nothing by 30, what do you get? <laughs> nothing. So it's, it's an undifferentiated oneness, a total oneness. Which, uh, that itself is amazing to contemplate, because we can't even think of what that is. You know, you might say there's nothing in this cup, right? You might say this cup's empty. You know, we call it empty, that there's nothing in it, but it's packed. It's packed full of air. Our minds can't even think of the nothingness that precedes the world. So how did this oneness become the many? How did the nothingness become actual physicality? How did it become this world that we're in right now? And the other question is why? Why? What, meaning, what's the purpose for us? What do we have to know about all this oneness and us being in the many? So I feel like starting today with the why, if you don't mind. Before God created the world, he existed in undifferentiated oneness as obviously it has no parts because before there was something there was nothing and that nothing is it's not distinguished by parts you can't have more than one nothing and for whatever reason and we're not sure why God decided to create other and chose to create the world and the world was created and we'll go into how not right now, how God did it. But God decided to create the world. And that world is filled with minerals, plants, vegetables, animals, and human beings. And the interesting ones of all the creation are the human beings, obviously, because, you know, I mean, if you ever had a pet rock, it's not very stimulating to be in a relationship with a pet rock. And if you've had a pet plant, you know, like a chia plant or something, chia pet, it's also not very stimulating. Um, you can have a dog, but they're loyal to a fault. You know, they just, their unconditional love is not normal. Whereas human beings, human beings are like a serious thing to have a relationship with because a human being can connect or disconnect. They can engage or disengage. They can say, I love you. They can say, I hate you. And that free will of human beings to connect or disconnect is what makes creation interesting. So we are kind of the point of it all. We're the point of it all. Now, every human being starts their life in undifferentiated oneness in the womb of their mother. So it's really interesting. God began the world from undifferentiated oneness and then created other. And we started our lives in the womb of our mothers in undifferentiated oneness. Started on the 40th day. The soul goes into the fetus on the 40th day and then spends its beginnings, major amounts of time, in the amniotic fluid, which is an undifferentiated oneness. And then after that, the baby is born into separateness. Ideally, the transition from oneness into separateness is done as carefully as possible so that the child doesn't have anything abrupt happen from the undifferentiated oneness of the womb to the separateness of life. In Western culture, it's generally more abrupt. It's out into the bright lights of an operating room. It hits to, uh, Now the baby's being cleaned up in a separate room. Hopefully it's at least warm. 
but then it's put in total isolation into a bassinet and then shipped off to a nursery and uh, gets a number, you know, bassinet number such and such. This is the name of the family, at least. And the mother goes to recover. And uh, they, they rendezvous. They rendezvous for feedings. But in Western culture, the mother's always declaring her independence from the child. She's always trying to, you know, still exist as an individual separate from that child. And, and so what they do is they say the baby's hungry all the time. And so what happens if the baby ever cries, so they, everyone says, it must be hungry. And so the mother feeds the baby, and the baby's so happy about it because the, the babies don't have a concept of food. And the baby wasn't even hungry. So what happened was the baby is just being stuffed. It's got the connection. It's got the human connection with the mommy. But it's, it's just being stuffed. And then it passes out. And so the mommy puts the baby down back in its little padded cell. And then she goes back to her email or whatever it is she does. Until, of course, the baby wakes up in utter isolation. And it begins to scream. Not because it's hungry. Babies have no concept of hunger. At that point, the uh, family says the baby's what? <coughs> hungry. And the baby's stuffed once more. Until it's put back into its little isolation tank. And so there's this constant connection and disconnection and connection and disconnection. It becomes a pattern of oneness and separateness and oneness and separateness. But the oneness never lasts. It always goes back to separateness. And many sociologists say that this is the nature, this is why the nature of relationships of Westerners when they become adults and they want to have intimacy, that it's always connection, disconnect, connection, disconnect. because that pattern began at birth. And this nature that I've been describing, this that I've been describing, does not exist in tribal cultures. I mean, if you go down to the Amazon, so when a baby is born, it stays with the mommy. And then she goes on to take care of that baby and hold that baby, and the baby's actually strapped with a sling to the baby, and she climbs trees, like if she's going to get coconuts, the baby's there. And they prove it by the fact that if you've ever noticed, like, the amazing grip of infants, they can't even hold their own head up. They have no muscle mass. Yet they have a grip that's like a hundred times the strength of any other muscle in their body. Because God created the baby to be with the mommy. And it needs to hold on. Because when the mommy's going to get water down river, or she's climbing a tree to get a coconut, or she's running from cannibals, you know, the baby's right there for all the action. There are even psychologists that say that that's the reason why Westerners have this daredevil aspect of them. Because they never got to have it. Because they were always put in these padded strollers with suspension systems. I'm interested to know that here in the old city, I'm wondering if the uh, if there's actually uh, if the kids are more chill as adults because no matter how much suspension you have, you're still on the old city stones. So it's like you know you're getting jiggled all around while the stroller pushes you. But it's like it was because of a miss. There was missed action that we're somehow trying to have later. Well, for us, one lesson for sure is when you have children is, is make sure it's not abrupt for them and really dedicate your time to make sure they don't really care who's holding them as long as it's someone. And they're not always so hungry. just want some human touch, human contact. Well, ever since you were separated from the oneness, 
you will notice that your whole life, all you have ever done is try to seek oneness again. That oneness has many names. Oneness, love, connection, wholeness, which in Hebrew is called shlemut, like the word shalom is the word wholeness. If you think about it, all you've ever done since you were born is you've been trying to seek the oneness again. There's all kinds of aspects. There's many spectrums to the oneness. So like, for example, you probably choose the colors you're wearing right now because you feel more connected in them. The fabrics you're wearing are probably because you feel more connected when you wear that fabric. But there's also the counterfeit of it all. There's, there's attention. Like getting attention is a, is a counterfeit to the oneness. That's why you'll see the biggest attention getters are the ones who usually suffer the most gruesome deaths, some kind of overdose at three in the morning because the, the vacuum of attention in the middle of the night is more than they can bear. They must numb the pain in that lack of attention, usually in the night of their biggest show. But everything we do is really to get that connection again. Now, there are two aspects to life. There's one aspect that's called Kalal. And there's another aspect of life that's called Parat. Kalal sounds a little bit like all, like being part of all. And prat is the exact word part, being apart, separate. And this has to do with uh, being part of group. And this has to do with being an individual. Klal and prat. Ever since you were born, that you have been on a journey between individuality and being part of a greater whole. Almost as if it's an instrument with two strings and you have to be good at both of them. So one of those strings is the string of who you are, and the other string is the string of, of how you relate to others. Most people are better, than one than the, uh, better at one than the other. And you also find a big distinction between the people raised observant versus those who were raised like myself, who were raised secular. So people who were raised observant, there's a big emphasis on community. And especially when you get to the black hatitude world, where everyone even dresses just like the clow. They dress like, you know, part of the whole. So not only is the dress like the whole, but the names are also, the names are not necessarily so unique. Uh, you can imagine how many kids, my kids, you know, I have a kid named Avraham. You can imagine how many kids were named Avraham in his school? You know, and uh, here's a better example. When a Rebbe passes away in a Hasidic group, let's say his name was Yoel, yeah? Joel, Yoel. So what happens, in, to honor the rabbi, the entire community names their next born son Yoel. So if you have, uh, let's say, the community is 150,000, and uh, f you might not have a child that year, or you might have a girl that year. So you're not going to name your girl Yoel. So you, know, you got about two and a half, three years worth of children named Yoel in that community. Now it's a giant community, so you have every class has 40 kids in it, and there's four, ki four classes per grade. So that makes 40, 80, 120, uh, 160. You have 160 kids per class, all named Yoel. Can you imagine what that's like? And the, and the whole grade, of the 160 above you and the 160 below you are all named Yoel as well. It kind of defeats the purpose of a first name. So you can imagine what people call them, what the rabbi calls them, 
to get anyone's attention. You're automatically relegated to last names. But last names are already your tribe. That's your father's home. It's your grandfather's home. It's it's well. And the individual is obviously not going to be showing up much there. In the secular life I grew up in, it was all about the individual. We had no idea where we came from. Because with when Europe burned down and was destroyed and left just a s- smoldering soot and rivers of blood had dried up and America started so many Jews just did ne- not want to look back at Europe it was such a nightmare even though there was so much beauty and greatness in Torah and spirituality pockets of absolute transcendence because of the, the hell that Europe turned into when Western countries, post-war Western countries, especially the U.S., Canada, England, South Africa, the Australian Jews, the Jews who stayed in France, they did not want to look back to that era. They didn't want to look back to that culture. They completely turned their backs on the group aspect of being, of being a Jew. And everything became the individual. It's all about you. It's all about you. The prat. The individual. And so we were developed as individuals and then developed and developed and developed. But the problem is we don't know how to be part of something. Because back in the old world where there was group and individual, so you were learning to be an individual and you were learning to be part of the group. And it was a constant interplay between group and individual. Today, in modern days, they use team sports for that. Team sports is to teach you about Klal and the, and then, you know, your own development in the secular world is mostly, it's emphasized as the individual. And they have school government, various other things that people do, but it's generally all individual based. But when it comes to being part of a group, if you've been raised with that level of individuality, it's almost impossible to become part of something. You'll see just when you go to the hotel on Friday night and people are dancing, you'll see that the the people who were raised in the secular world, they're raised in the individual world. You'll see they'll dance. Well, first of all, it's hard to get themselves to dance. But let's say they get themselves to dance. And so now they're dancing. Well, once you're in that circle, there's no beginning, there's no end. You are now part of group. There's no individuality. When you're in a circle dancing, it's an amazing feeling because you're just like part of something bigger right now. But you'll see that if you watch them after about 45 seconds to a minute, they will stop, let go, and start clapping like this. So these dorky looks on their face. And <laughs> And they like they don't dance anymore. They're just kind of there. There's no more dancing. And the u- excuse they usually use is because when it gets too crowded, so people who know what they're doing will actually make an inner circle. But the outer circle thinks, oh, we're going to clap for them. <laughs> so now, like, the majority guys have all stopped because they're all... This does not exist. This phenomenon, we all know the phenomenon. That's why you're laughing. This does not exist in the observant community. There's no such thing as suddenly letting go and clapping. It just doesn't exist. If you're dancing, you're dancing. If you stop, you're clapping, you're clapping. But you're only clapping because it's the father and the groom. You know, it's the father and his son that clap. You know, you're clapping for him. But not because you suddenly realize you're holding hands with a bunch of men. (laughs) If my friends could see me now... It's like we're allergic to group. And you see that back in the old world, where the group world used to marry you off, every one of you would have been married part of parenting. See, we think parenting means feeding the kid, paying his bills, and like, but eventually, you know, you get him out of your house. In the old days, your kid didn't get out of your house until your child was married, and you made sure for them that they married and that they married the right partner. 
And they were so young that they were really still part of the house. So it wasn't like they ate their meals elsewhere. They, they still eat in your house. You eat lunch by this one, and then you go to your in-laws for dinner, pass over the first year, they come to the, the, the bride's house. So this year, please God, we'll be having our new son-in-law at our house because we, we're still living in that world, which is so weird for me because I'm just so individual. You see that even with my... Even with my look, you know, you'd think that I just, my individuality is getting squished. Do you guys get a sense my individuality is getting squished? Not at all. But when we look from the outside in, we're sure <laughs> it must be getting squished. Nothing's getting squished. But anyway, this year they'll be with us because they're just kids. Our, our children who are getting married are kids. But I'm, I'm a father who's taking care of my daughter all the way. I'm not leaving her for the wolves to feed on until God knows what, until she turns 37 and gets so freaked out that she might not be able to have kids that she finally settles with somebody. Full responsibility. And and that's what happened is Westerners think responsibility is wrong. Something wrong with her. You want little responsibility. (laughs) That's what we're taught in the Western world. And therefore, as soon as they were able to push off having to marry off our own kids, as soon as they could get rid of that, that was like, great. And now on top of that, you tell them that they have to be financially stable before they get married. So now you no longer have to pay for their lives after the marriage. So it's like, boom. Score. I don't have to worry about marrying them, and I don't have to worry about paying for it after their marriage. Yeah, I might help with the wedding, but you're on your own. Anyway, but you see that people just, relationships are crazy. People's relationships are crazy. People who have, it's like, can you imagine if they got rid of having, needing a license to drive? And got rid of the age limit too? No more license necessary, no more age limit, okay? It's kind of like uh, Colorado with marijuana these days or something like that. Imagine they do that with driving. Yeah, they do have driving. Why should you have to have a license? As long as you can control a car. So, you know, as long as every kid has a couple phone books to sit on, you know, and he can touch the accelerator, let him drive. This is the way most people are dating today. And there's a lot of crashes. And unfortunately, once you're letting your heart be involved in something, now you're in the big leagues because the heart doesn't have a lot of chances to break. It gets about one. As everyone in this room knows that if your heart ever broke, you've never given, you've never given it up again. You've never given it up again to someone else. Not like that. Not that level of full disclosure, full exposure. This whole Western thing has been a... Uh, it's been a, a nightmare of an experiment, and we're all the, we are all the mice. We are the mice in this, in this experiment. A completely untested experiment. They're testing it on us. And so when you ask what Judaism is, I'll tell you one thing it is, is sanity. Sanity. And if you want to know what relationships are, for that person who mentioned relationships. It's having a really healthy individuality that can, from that healthy individual place, choose to be part of other. Choose to be part of group. And group includes marriage. That's also group. It's a small group, but it's group. Choose to be part of community. Choose to be part of the Jewish people. <coughs> and that's where healthy relationships come from. Healthy individuality that comes from a powerful place of choosing to relate to the group level. And if something goes wrong ever in these two, so that's where we have to heal. So if someone was in group and something went wrong, they're going to have issues with group. 
And if something goes wrong with someone as an individual, so they're going to have to heal in their individuality. But that's really the point of it all. Ever since we were separated from the undifferentiated oneness of our mother's womb, we have sought connection. We have sought oneness. We are all looking for that wholeness. But many of us have sought it in all kinds of weird ways. There is a certain oneness that a guy in a Harley Davidson feels when he's just throttling it and it's just making all that blah, 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 and shooting down the highway and it's just, he's connected. But he's missing the point. And I can tell you after thousands of hours of surfing, six hours a day, some days eight hours, 12 years straight, every day. Thousands of hours, there was a tremendous addictive connection. But I totally missed it. Totally missed it because I didn't realize. We're all hardwired to seek oneness. We're all hardwired to feel that original connection. But I think everyone right now who's hearing me say all this has to come to a place in his or her heart that you want the real thing. And when I say the real thing, you probably think what I mean is God. And I do. But God himself has put many vibrational frequencies to connect with in this world that are likenesses their likenesses of connecting with him. Probably of the most important ones is beer. <laughs> Perhaps one much more important is using your ability to vocalize in prayer, to be able to speak in prayer to God, but from a really concentrated place because everything in this world is vibrational patterns and when I use my prayer using those vibrational frequencies not reading it, saying it which means I get a, get a fluency in my Hebrew to really get to the code because the Hebrew is the code of creation but you don't want to say it without <coughs> understanding it because then you won't have your heart involved so you want your heart and the frequencies together which means starting in English just to get, if English is your language to get the meaning but then adapting it all the way to the Hebrew and then just and then letting that start to really flow out loud. Connection. And if you look into Judaism, you look into Kabbalah, it's always talking about the union of man and woman, male and female. And that is the ultimate connection of the physical world to connect with God is through husband and wife. That is the key connection. It's one of the cleanest frequencies. The cleanest frequencies to connect with God is the oneness that two individuals form when they become one whole group unit together. And you see from that comes children, comes the group. The group builds. The tribe builds off of that frequency. Then there's geography. The land of Israel is just an amazing, amazing antenna for these frequencies, these godly frequencies. But most important, the ultimate lightning rod of all the frequencies is right outside this window, which is the Holy of Holies. Underneath this giant platform outside, this huge platform that's covering the top of this mountain, there is the actual pinnacle of the mountain, which is a stone. It's under that gold dome. It sticks out. You can Google it. You shouldn't go see it yourself because a Jew's not allowed in there. But you should, uh, I mean, a Kohen's allowed once the temple's built. But the uh, sticking out of that platform is like this rock. You can, you can see it online on Google Images. And that rock is the spot where the Holy of Holies of the temple is.
Now, the temple doesn't exist right now in physical, but in all the parallel realms, it still exists. And it's, um, it's there. We just, you know, because of our history and what's gone wrong, we don't have it right now. But this is a, that spot, the Holy of Holies, is a lightning rod between God and creation. It's where heaven and earth meet. So even in geography, there is this coming to, back to oneness with God. As an individual, I can do that with prayer, but as a group, on the group level, it's done in Jerusalem. The high priest, the coin guttle doing his service, the Levites backing him up, and then the Israelites coming for the pilgrimage festivals, and being here and attaching themselves to this most core vibrational pattern of oneness. Marriage is super high. The union of male and female in marriage, in Jewish marriage, is super high frequency. But in geography, the ultimate frequency is right here in Jerusalem. What I'm saying I can prove to you is true. Because you'll notice in your own life when you visit Jerusalem, you'll notice the stuff you're used to having all day, every day. And think about your life, where you're from. Just imagine yourself and where you, your couch is. Think about your couch, where you... I don't know if you're in university or your parents' house. I don't know where you live. You have an apartment somewhere. Imagine yourself and the stuff you busy yourself with. You will notice that while you're here, you won't even think about it. I don't care if you watch TV six hours a day. You will not have even noticed that you didn't watch a television program. I don't care if you golfed all day like you were like a golf freak. You will totally forget that you play golf. Whatever it is that you've been replacing the frequencies with, with the distractions, the distracted frequencies that you busy yourself with, you'll notice whenever in your Jeris- you're in Jerusalem, you totally forget about it. Which means you're in touch now with the key vibrational frequencies of the oneness of Hashem. And in Jerusalem, you're just totally connected to it. Things you might have done that were like wrong, you'll find here in Jerusalem, you just don't feel the same draw. You don't feel drawn to it the same way. I can tell you myself, I, I was living in Santa Barbara, surfing in, uh, you know, I surfed internationally, I surfed very high level surfing, but I was in the ultimate location in Santa Barbara. It's the ultimate location on a university campus that's surrounded on three sides by surf spots. But the five years that I was in Santa Barbara, there was a drought, a five-year drought. And so, you know, there were waves, but we almost had to get in our cars every day and drive down to Ventura. We had to drive up to the Central Coast above Point Conception. And we just... It was lousy five years of surfing. And the year I came to Israel, the year I came to Jerusalem to study Torah, it was the year of 1991 into 92. That was an El Nino year. El Nino is a weather pattern that turns Santa Barbara into Hawaii when it comes to surf. It's just unbelievable surf. And I was here in Jerusalem studying Torah on the biggest snowy winter in Israel's history. I'm a Southern Californian missing El Nino. And this was back in the day when Eish Torah was a very simple place. So we had like heat rationing. We were allowed two hours at night and an hour in the morning. And we only showered on Fridays because just, you just couldn't take off your clothes. So we'd shower before Shabbat. And I slept in a sleeping bag, a mummy bag. And I could only see my... All I'd have is my nose and mouth sticking out. I remember every morning the whole winter, opening up the bag and steam coming out. And all I'd see is steam going into the morning light. And yeah, okay, once I said, like, what in the world am I doing here? And I got postcards and phone calls from friends going like, are you out of your mind? It's El Nino. Santa Barbara is going off. 
That's a surf term. The, wa the waves are going off. To me, it just it just strengthened me. It was just like, oh, so choices are only as powerful as what you choose not. So since I'm not surfing El Nino, that makes this choice all the more powerful. But if it wasn't for those postcards and those phone calls, I wouldn't have even thought about it here in Jerusalem because I was plugged in. And I'm here now 22 years. And I'm more plugged in now because now I really start to understand the frequencies. Start to understand a little more about it. Or maybe a lot more about it. And so I'm more plugged in now. I've never been to a place, I've traveled a lot of places, where it didn't wear off soon. It never wears off here. Your eyes get clearer, brighter. There are those who say that when you come to Jerusalem, your age ends there. That's where you end. And it's kind of interesting when I tell people how old I am, they're like, what? <coughs> how could you be that old? I already told you guys I'm marrying off a girl. So, you know, I've been here for a while. But something special happening here. This is the key frequency of the oneness between Klal and Prat, between group and individuality. The creation itself is individual to God. But when the creation itself comes and unites, that's Mashiach. That's the times of Mashiach where everyone realizes that we don't want counterfeit. We don't want garbage. We want the real thing. And so I invite and challenge everyone in here who's listening to this to dedicate your life to the real thing. Real frequencies. Real connection. Building yourself as an individual. I'm sure a lot of us have to do a lot of work to get ourselves worked out as individuals. But also, learning how to be part of. How to be part of Klal, part of the whole. And so I bless us all to have the oneness we seek in a real way. We should all be blessed with fulfillment, connectivity, love, and ultimately to find our way to Redemption. Amen. Amen. Amen.